everybody. How you doing? And welcome to episode number 141 of the John Riley Project. And tonight it's Juneteenth. It's June 19th, 2020. And boy, we're going to talk about a lot of great issues tonight. We're going to talk about, of course, Juneteenth. We're going to talk about um, statues and the statues coming down. We're going to talk a bit about DACA. Um, so this is going to be a great podcast episode. And I mean, we're really the, the overarching topic tonight is going to be about justice, which I think is really important. And, you know, this podcast, of course, all about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And all these things kind of align when you break it down. So we're going to have fun kind of going through this. I got some fun stories to tell you as we walk through some of these issues. Um, but before we get started, I just want to you know, put this out there, you know, if if you're a fan of this podcast, if you enjoy watching or listening, maybe you're watching on YouTube, listening, wherever you get your podcasts, you know, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. In fact, I think we're now on iHeartRadio and we run a bunch of new podcast only platforms. So I need to compile an updated list. Um, but wherever you happen to be listening or, or viewing this, it, it'd be really helpful if you can subscribe, if you can like, or if you can share, you know, because what I'm trying to do is build the audience and, and the best way to build the audience really is through word of mouth. So if there are things here you like, um, yeah, share it with a friend. Um, certainly subscribe. If you're on YouTube, you can click on the subscribe button and the little bell next to it where you'll get updates on future episodes. Um, you know, so, you know, this podcast is all about a, you know, it's a community forum. I enjoy the dialogue and hopefully you like what we're talking about. Maybe you disagree. I'm always very open to the, the input, the conversation. And I think that kind of dialogue, that kind of openness, Hopefully it's something you like, something you support. And if you do, you know, if you could subscribe, like, or share these podcast episodes, boy, that'd be really, really helpful. Um, Okay, so enough of my plea for support. Um, Let's move on. And I just want to start it off with a quote. I think this is just a wonderful quote that I discovered when I was preparing for this podcast. And it's, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. And this is from Cornell West. And, you know, Cornell West, pretty interesting person. We see him as a guest frequently um, on the national news. You know, he's an American philosopher, a political activist, a social critic, an author, a public intellectual. He speaks on a lot of race issues. Uh, But Cornell West, yeah, he said, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. And it makes you think about that. And you have to ask yourself, you know, what is justice? What does justice really mean? And and I want to kind of define it, you know, up front for everybody, because justice, I think, is going to be the common thread that uh, that we're going to follow as we go through some of these various current events, some of these topics that we're going to explore. So what is justice? I mean, some people think justice is just fairness. Um, Justice maybe is moral righteousness. Um, Maybe legally you might think justice is a system of law um, in which every person receives his or her due from the system, including all rights, including have all of your rights secured, you know, whether they're legal rights or whether they're natural rights. And yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I think as, as someone else had told me this, and, and I thought this made a lot of sense. Justice is basically getting what you deserve. And for some people, that's that um, can be a positive thing. And for others, it can be a negative thing. But that's, I think, the essence of fairness, um, the essence of doing what's morally right. And so it, it's, it's interesting, too, because this definition, I'm going to take a little bit of an aside here, where... The system is justice, a system of law in which every person receives his or her due from the system, including all rights, both natural and legal. And, you know, we talk a little bit about this on this podcast. You know, it's about life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And obviously that comes from our Declaration of Independence, our inalienable rights. I mean, these are what we call natural rights. These are the rights that we have for every human has these rights. They essentially precede government. You know, there are rights by default. And some people don't really understand that for what that means. I mean, it means that, 
you know, as a human, we have human rights. We have the right to to think, to speak, to act, to move. Um, you know, we have the the right to pursue our survival. I mean, these are essentially natural rights. And um, I think our founders were very wise when they, you know, put that into our Declaration of Independence and established that as the moral foundation for our nation. But of course, they've gotten a lot of it wrong. I mean, they they had the right idea, but the implementation of those natural rights is where things have fallen down. But little by little, we're making progress. We're getting better at it. And, you know, right now, I, I think this is a very interesting time because we're going through, I think, is a really, our history books are going to look back at this and say, this was a major moment in our history as a nation. You considering all these things that we're going through in 2020. I mean, besides the whole COVID crisis, it's everything to do with George Floyd and racial justice. Um, you know, it, it's it's a really, a, it's, a, it's an inflection point on the curve. And it really all comes down to justice, in my opinion. And I think Justice will be the the theme for tonight, um, and we're you know we're we're not obviously correcting it all in one swoop. There's so many other categories where we've got to fix things as a society. But I think we're making progress as we're coming through this. I mean, in fact, I think this is one of the um, one of the silver linings, if you will, to the the protests and to. Um, uh, all of the, you know, the, the marching in the streets. I think in many ways we're waking up. We're we're moving forward. We're progressing. We're learning a great deal. And so, I mean, speaking about learning, I mean, let let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, Juneteenth, and you know, I think a lot of people are really for the first time in their lives understanding what Juneteenth really is all about. And I I think a simple way to explain this, and I've, I've been learning a lot more about this as well, but it's almost like a second Independence Day for the United States of America. And, you know, here's a, an interesting short summary of it. Um, on January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and sadly, it took more than two years for that news to reach enslaved African Americans in Galveston, Texas uh, on June 19th, 1865. So, yeah, they, they took a long time for the news to travel. Um, we honor and celebrate the day that all black Americans became free and we continue to fight for racial equality for all Americans. Let I, I lifted that quote. You know where that came from? Uh, NASCAR racer Jimmy Johnson um, actually posted this. Uh, my buddy Larry, uh, shout out to Larry, kind of tipped me off on this. And and what Jimmy Johnson posted is is almost perfectly accurate because actually um, when Juneteenth occurred, you know the, the news traveled slowly to Texas, but it was also purposely delayed because a lot of slave owners escaped from, you know, some of the other southern states and went as far away as they could to maximize their slave labor as long as they could. And in fact, they were delaying the delivery of the message for a point of time. Um, but on Juneteenth, still technically not all slaves are free. There were still slaves that were in some of the northern states in Kentucky and in Delaware. Um, and the, slavery wasn't fully declared illegal um, until the 13th Amendment was ratified in December of 1865. Um, but I think we can all agree that this really whether we want to get technical and break it down, the, the real point is, is that this is another Independence Day. I mean, this is the day that you could say that the slaves became truly free. Um, you know, certainly when Abraham Lincoln announced the, the Emancipation Proclamation, it was just in a speech, but it never became law. The message wasn't fully delivered. This should be, in my opinion, just an absolute no-brainer that this should be celebrated in America. Um, it's another Independence Day. And what's more American than liberty? What is more American than freedom? What is more American than independence? 
So it's just weird how, like, for some people, there's pushback on this. Some people don't think it's a real deal. Some people are questioning the validity of, of Juneteenth. I'm, I'm saying, people, come on. I mean, the more you learn about this, the more you realize how critically important this is in American history. Um, so I, I, I think this is just fantastic. And it's fantastic that we're waking up to all of this. I mean, again, this is kind of the silver lining um, of what has occurred, you know, since the tragic murder of George Floyd. So we're, we're learning, we're progressing as a society. But then it makes you wonder, like, why are people not hearing about Juneteenth? And, and I never heard about it. Um, maybe you did. I, I certainly didn't. Um, I can't recall this was ever discussed in any of my history classes in you know, elementary school, high school. I, I didn't really take history classes in college. Although if I were to roll back the clock, I probably would have studied history and a lot of different things. Um, I was more in the math computer science world when I was in college, but um, I still don't recall ever hearing about this. And some people said, oh yeah, it was, it was Jubilee Day. And then I'm learning, well, maybe it was celebrated in Texas, but it wasn't celebrated in all the different states. And then I keep wondering, this is amazing. This seems to me like a major failure of our education system that this day, Juneteenth, the second Independence Day in America, is just not widely understood, that it's just not embraced. I mean, this is a holiday that we should all come together on. Why isn't this taught in our schools? Or if it is taught in our schools, why is it so sporadic? I mean, certainly July 4th, 1776 is not... Um, discussed sporadically. That's a universal truth. Um, why is this one not so universal? And, the, and I'll begin a little bit of a tangent. To me, this is why we have, a, we have to talk about our educational system. We need major reform. But right now, the establishment or the government or public schools have essentially close to a monopoly on K through 12 education, um, only a very small fraction of those that go to K through 12 are actually going to non-public schools. Maybe they're going to private schools, charter schools. But this continuation, I mean, they talk about systemic racism and how it's interwoven in our culture. Well, it's interwoven in our education system. It makes me wonder why, you know, our are, are people calculating and, and choosing to leave it out or uh, leave Juneteenth out of our history books? Are they maybe just unaware and they're just kind of going along with it? You know, the, the people that write our textbooks that, that um, you know, essentially train our teachers, that develop our curriculum. Why is that? So... I don't know. I'm, a, I'm an advocate for school choice. I always have been. I mean, imagine if there were schools that are out there that would actually teach the complete history of the United States, not the white history or the black history, but all history. Imagine that. Uh, because right now, I think a lot of people would say that we're getting the quote unquote white version of history uh, because the victor in many of these cases is the one that writes the history. Um, some people would call this privilege. Um, but I, I think if we had a, a, a more open, <laughs> a freer education system, I think there would be a lot more schools that would be teaching the complete package of history and actually would be putting a lot of pressure on a lot of our government schools to get with the program. Now, I think because of what's going on right now with the whole Black Lives Matter movement and everything else, lots of people are waking up. I think we're going to start to see some change. And I think that's that's possible. But, you know, how much agitation has gone on for so many decades about trying to get more black history into our history classes, and yet the needle rarely moves on that. Um, but anyways, I digress. It is interesting that we're just learning about this. And Another um, one of my previous guests on the podcast, Kim Garnier, she um, posted this on Facebook. I thought this was really interesting. And she said, it's no accident that you learned about Helen Keller instead of W.E.B. -E Dubois. You learned about the Watts and L.A. riots, but not Tulsa or Wilmington. 
and I want to make a comment about Tulsa, but let me save that till I finish reading through this. You learned that George Washington's dentures were made of wood rather than the teeth from slaves. You learned about black ghettos, but not about black Wall Street. You learned about the New Deal, but not the redlining. You learned about Tommy Smith's fist in the air at the 1968 Olympics, but not that he was sent home the next day and stripped of his medals. You learned about black crime, but white criminals were never lumped together and discussed in terms of their race. You learned about states' rights and the cause for the Civil War, but not the fact that slavery was mentioned 80 times in the Articles of Secession. Um, Privilege is having history rewritten so that you don't have to acknowledge uncomfortable facts. Racism is perpetuated by a system who refuse to learn or acknowledge this reality. You have a choice. Happy Juneteenth. <laughs> so just a, this is very interesting. Um, I want to break some of this down because generally speaking, what I just said is generally right on the target. There's a couple of things I can quibble about. Like W.E.B. Du Bois, I remember hearing about him, but honestly, if you were to ask me right now what is you know, the two-sentence description of who he is and what he did, I don't know. Um, I know it was taught to me a long time ago, but I don't remember that portion of history, to be very frank with you. Um, I've known about, of course, about the Watts riots and the L.A. riots. I mean, um, the L.A. riots, I assume they're talking about Rodney King. I mean, I was living here in San Diego when that happened, but not Tulsa or Wilmington. Tulsa is an interesting one because... You know, obviously, right now, President Trump is in Tulsa uh, about to give uh, another one of his rallies. Uh, He's going to do that tomorrow night. But Tulsa, we learned about this huge um, race based, like essentially like a firebomb of the city. Um, And I didn't learn about it until I watched the HBO series, The Watchmen. I don't know if you knew about it, of what happened in Tulsa. This was like almost 100 years ago. It's amazing that that was never taught to me. I never even heard that story, um, yet it was conveniently left out of the history books that I studied. Um, Yeah, George Washington's teeth made out of wood. I've often heard that was a myth. I didn't know that it was from the teeth of slaves. Um, Yeah, we learned about the New Deal, but not redlining. I think a lot of us have learned about redlining, especially in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, Yeah, the whole notion of The Civil War was about states' rights. I mean, it was definitely about slavery. And by the way, states don't have rights. People have rights, Um, which is a whole other digression. Of course, the Tenth Amendment, which, by the way, is almost ignored entirely, is about defining the scope of government. And if it's beyond the scope of the definition for the federal government, it becomes the jurisdiction of the states. And if not them, then certainly the jurisdiction of each of us as individuals to make our own choices. But really, states don't have rights, people have rights. So the whole concept, states' rights, kind of a misnomer in my opinion. Um, But yeah, the Civil War was about slavery, I mean, obviously. So this is just interesting. And then, you know, it concludes with, you have a choice. Now, I'll give, um, make sure I'm clear on this. Kim Garnier didn't write this. I mean, she was reposting something that she had picked up which, again, I think is generally very, very accurate. Um, But you have a choice. Well, do we? I mean, when it comes to education, how much choice do we have? Um, If you're wealthy, you have a choice to go to a, a, to a, a, a different school. But if you're poor and you're born in a um, weak school district and you don't have many choices right then, you're stuck with the education system that you're delivered. Um, and oftentimes you're getting the version of history that I was taught, which some people would say is the white version of history. It's interesting. Uh, Very interesting. So again, we're going, this is just a big transformation time in America's history. And I think, you know, George Floyd was murdered. um, But a lot is coming from that. We're we're moving forward. We're learning. We're getting better. And I think that's great. Um, You know, I A lot of people have been saying, when did you first hear about Juneteenth? And I first heard about it probably like it was in the mid-1990s. And I was working uh, for a company up in Vista, which is in North San Diego County. And one of my my coworkers uh, was a a young African-American. And 
he was telling me about this celebration that they were having at a, a park in Oceanside, and it was for Juneteenth. And I'm like, what's Juneteenth? I never knew anything about it. And he was saying, well, it's when the slaves were finally freed. And I was like, hmm, okay. And I was, I mean, meanwhile, I'm thinking in my head, well, th yeah, they were already freed. I mean, that's what the Civil War was all about. But it just seemed like when I was learning about it from him that it was kind of a like a black cultural event. Um, and I was curious and I didn't really know much about it. I probably should have asked a lot more questions. Maybe even I should have attended the celebration, but I didn't. But I always remembered it because Juneteenth is kind of an unusual name, right? Um, so it stuck with me. And then as time continued, now, heck, we're now 25 years later. Um, I heard a little bit more about it and a little bit more about it. But now, this year, you're just suddenly hearing so much about it. Um, and it's inter again, it's interesting how we evolve and how we learn. And the more I'm, I'm th this podcast is all about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty is part of this podcast. Juneteenth is about liberty. I mean, this is a this should be, like I said, a no brainer to be a national holiday. A national holiday. This is an easy choice. If I were supreme dictator of the world, um, I mean. Yeah, what could be what could be more American than liberty? Um, last uh, summer, uh, my wife and I we went on a on a vacation, and we we first went to Butte, Montana, and we went there to research some of my family history. Uh, my my um, ancestors came from uh, Kinsale, which is in southern Ireland, and then they many of them uh, were in the in the mines in Butte, Montana. Um, I had a chance to walk in their footsteps, which was wonderful. But then after we wrapped up what we were doing in Butte, um, we went on a vacation that we had always talked about going on, and we went and visited Nashville, Memphis, and New Orleans. And in fact, if you if you're so interested, I did a whole podcast episode on this vacation um, and the things that we experienced, and it was fabulous. But one of the the big highlights for us was when we were in Memphis, Tennessee, and we went to the National Civil Rights Museum, and it's right there in the Lorraine Motel, the motel where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And man, that what a moving experience that was. And I, I really felt it was important to go to this museum. It was on our itinerary of the things that we wanted to accomplish when we were going through each of these cities. But what's interesting is as I've gotten older, as I've learned more about maybe my own view of morality, of maybe my own interpretation of what makes this country great, is really understanding what our founders meant by the whole notion of inalienable rights. And so when I look at what Martin Luther King Jr. did and what many other civil rights leaders did, what they were doing wasn't necessarily just fighting for black rights. It wasn't just a black thing. They were fighting for American values. They were fighting for equality under the law. And what they were doing was absolutely righteous. So I... You know, I'm, I'm in the Civil Rights Museum with my wife and, you know, I'd say two thirds of the people in the museum with us were African-American, maybe even three quarters. And everyone sees this history through their own lens. And I'm a liberty guy. Some people say I'm libertarian, but I'm definitely looking at the National Civil Rights Museum through that lens of liberty. And man, it's powerful. It's very moving um, to think about how, how Martin Luther King Jr. was so effective at what he did, yet we still have not really fulfilled his dream. Um, but again, this is about justice, right? I mean, justice is the, is the, is the theme here in this podcast episode. So I, 
I just want to share one piece of, of the I Have a Dream speech, and I shared this in a previous podcast, but I'm just going to take a very tiny excerpt from it, from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which is all about liberty, equality, and justice. And he said, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He goes on to say that, you know, the blacks have gotten a blank check. You know, they haven't been delivered this promissory note, and he's right, um, but he was really calling for that higher ideal. And man, it's just fantastic. So, to me, this is all very consistent. Um, what we're learning about civil rights leaders back in the days, you know, before the Civil War, after the Civil War, um, you know, during the 60s and what Martin Luther King Jr. Um, did, and even some of the civil rights leaders today, it is all about justice. And in many cases, it's all about freedom. But the crazy part of this is, is that there are still people to this day, and I've seen them online, it, they just mock this. They think Juneteenth is a joke. They think it's just some black thing and it's not worthy of our support. And the funny thing is, is that these are the people that you typically see embracing America and embracing freedom. We're all for freedom. But if you're really for freedom, then you got to be for Juneteenth. It's a no-brainer, folks. So new, Juneteenth should absolutely be a national holiday and um, to not only celebrate Independence Day number two, um, but also as a matter of justice, the freeing of slaves. One of the most fantastic you know, achievements in the world of liberty in our nation was freeing of slaves, giving liberty to those that didn't have it before. Now, granted, they never got full liberty, um, and we've been working on that. And they've come, uh, I say they, uh, we as a society have come a long way. But this, again, this is, uh, Juneteenth should be a national holiday. Let's move on. Um, I want to talk about these statues. And how a lot of these statues are coming down, people are tearing down statues. Um, but I first want to start off with a quote, and this is from Benjamin Franklin. And he said, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. Okay, that's good. And I think we're seeing that now, right? A lot of people that were unaffected by a lot of these situations are now becoming outraged. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. again said something very similar. He said, it's not possible to be in favor of justice for some people and not in favor of justice for all people. So now let's look at that through, um, you know, let's look at the topic of the statues and the statues coming down. And we're seeing this with like Confederate leaders, right? And that was really what started the whole Charlottesville uh, situation um, when there was a statue of Robert E. Lee in that city and they wanted to tear it down. And that got all of the um, uh, white supremacists enraged and they were all out there with polo shirts and tiki torches. Um, and also, you know, uh, what was the... Um, what was it? No soil, no blood. I can't remember the line, but definitely lifted from uh, Nazi Germany. Um, but it was it was clear racism, bigotry. Frankly, it was flat out Nazism that was being shared there at Charlottesville. But what they were doing was there was a. Yeah, a statue of Robert E. Lee, the the leader of the Confederate Army, you could say the leader of the army of the enemy being celebrated in a public square, taking that statue down, a lot of people think that's the right thing to do. In fact, some people say having Confederate statues 
in the United States is like having a statue of Osama bin Laden at ground zero. You know, these are the enemy. You know, we shouldn't be celebrating them, no matter how you feel about Robert E. Lee, because a lot of people think of him very highly. But still, he was fighting an immoral cause. He was fighting to to restrict liberty, to restrict our inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, some people will say, well, you can't tear these statues down. You're erasing history. You know, you're whitewashing history, you know, no pun intended. Um, and, you know, I used to think that way. I, I, I used to think that way. Because, I mean, I obviously wasn't a supporter of these, these Confederates, um, leaders, these Confederate generals, these Confederate politicians, obviously. But I thought, okay, so I used to think wrongly. I used to think, well, it's the Southern culture. And and even if you believe that they were evil, well, at least we have a representation of that evilness that we can learn from as a society. I used to think that way. And I realized I was wrong. I was absolutely wrong. And it was funny because um, a few years ago, I got a chance to go to Europe for my first time. And my daughter was um, studying in Florence. She went there for the summer. And I went out and met her. And I flew into Rome. We rented a car, by the way. And we drove from Rome up through, um, we went to Bologna and a number of other cities in Northern Italy. And then we wrapped around the top of the Adriatic, I guess it is. Went to Slovenia, by the way. Went to Lake Bled, which is this wonderful place. It was like a paradise, a little lake with a um, with an island in the center and a castle on top of that island. Um, and then we went to um, Croatia, and then um, eventually drove back to Italy. Went, we were in uh, was it Verona, and then we got on a train and we went over the Alps and we went to Munich. And the whole time we were in every city we visited, we had, you know who Rick Steves is? He's like this PB, KPBS, you know, uh, public broadcasting. He's the, the Europe guy. And he has this free app that you can download and you get walking tours through some of these cities. And he's fantastic. And we were in Munich for like three days and it was fantastic. We really enjoyed ourselves. But, you know, you're walking around Munich. You don't see statues of Hitler. You don't see statues of Goebbels. You don't see statues of these other um, Third Reich leaders. They tore them down. And, and they didn't want to, they didn't erase them from history in Germany. I mean, they acknowledged their history. They, they acknowledged the sins of that nation. Um, if you believe a, a nation can sin, really it was people that sinned, but they acknowledged that that part of their history needed to be corrected and they can't erase it. They need to acknowledge it, but it's certainly, they don't need to celebrate it. They don't need to glorify it. They don't need to have a statue of Hitler in downtown Munich in the public square. So they rightfully took those statues down and moved them. And I think in some cases they're in parks or in museums, or they're maybe hidden away in some cases. Um, and it made me think a lot more about that. And I thought, yeah, a lot of these statues, if they don't need to be, quote unquote, torn down, you know, demolished, like the way they pull down the Saddam Hussein statue in, in Baghdad and, and, and actually, you know, destroyed. Some of those statues, I think, belong in museums, rightfully so. Um, that's the appropriate venue where we can learn from history. We can learn the mistakes of history. And that's the appropriate place for it. And, you know, when my wife and I were on that trip and we, we flew in an, into Nashville and then we rented a car and we drove to Memphis where we went to the National Civil Rights Museum and did a bunch of other things in Memphis. That was wonderful. Um, Memphis, by the way, was my favorite of those three cities. And then when we left Memphis, we headed south. We were on our way to New Orleans and... I wanted to stop in Vicksburg, and Vicksburg is uh, the site of a really famous war or a famous battle in the Civil War, and it's right there on the Mississippi River, and it was, you know, probably like about 30, 45 minutes off the freeway of the main route. I figured, oh, we got to go, and that was awesome, and I, we, there was like a drive-through area of... Um, the, the hills and the, and the battle scene, and there are memorials 
for um, northern armies, and you'll see like it'll be like the army from Ohio or Massachusetts. And then there's also memorials for the Southern armies, and they're represented by Southern states. And then there is a museum there, and I we walked through the museum, and there we saw Confederate um, soldiers and descriptions of what happened, you know, statues. That made a lot of sense. I mean, it was it was at the scene of, a, of an important battle. It felt like that was history properly in its proper context, but we didn't necessarily see the, um, and, and by the way, the, the, the Northern armies defeated the Southern armies at Vicksburg. It was a really critical um, inflection point, to use that word again, an inflection point in the war, but we still didn't see those commanders of the Southern army, you know, essentially celebrated in those cities it was a certain sense of reverence, you know, for all the loss of life that happened there. It made sense there that that's where those statues need to be, not in some high visibility place, you know, in in the um, um, in downtown in a big city with lots of visibility and lots of traffic. And so I, I've definitely changed. I, I think it makes sense for us as a nation to re-examine our history, re-examine our values, and if we really are a nation that's built on our inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you can't be celebrating leaders, military leaders, that were all about keeping people in chains and denying them rights. That doesn't make any sense at all. That's inconsistent with our values. So when these people are talking about moving these statues, I'm like, um, yeah, you know, and let's maybe find someone better, you know, someone better that we can, um, you know, celebrate as an important part of our nation's history, rather than making excuses on why we've got these um, leaders from a failed nation that was frankly the enemy of the United States that supported keeping people in chains we got to move on from that, for folks. Um, taking some of these statues down and putting them in a museum makes a ton of sense. And then we'll, let's debate who should be replaced. Now, it's interesting. There's another category where we're seeing a lot of this, and it's not just with the Confederacy. It's with Christopher Columbus. We're starting to see, well, not starting. We've been seeing this going on for a while now where Christopher Columbus was for a good part of American history was, hey, he discovered America and therefore he becomes this famous person. And, you know, people begin examining history and they're saying, well, actually, Christopher Columbus killed a lot of innocent people. He was a conqueror. And why are we celebrating this guy? And and so it became, again, sort of a cultural thing. And, and then suddenly people started saying we should rename Columbus Day, which is it's in October, right? And we should rename that holiday National Indigenous People Day. And I'm like, interesting. You know, this is America. The indigenous people were the Americans before we were here. Yeah, maybe that might make sense, potentially. Um, there were a lot of fair points that were being made. But then it makes you wonder, like, why is Christopher Columbus so widely celebrated in America? And to me, this is interesting because obviously he didn't discover it. And you know, there were other people from Europe that had been here before. And there were also, frankly, there were people that were already here. It's not like he was the first man to, to step foot on the moon. I mean, there were people that were already here. So he, he didn't discover anything. I mean, it was already here. Um, but I understand why Christopher Columbus would be important to Europeans as part of European history because – he was the first one in a larger sense, in a more public sense, that had connected the new world with the old world, So, which allowed Europe to grow and expand and, and essentially colonize. From, Europe, from the view of a European, I get it, especially if you're Italian, because um, he was an Italian, Christopher Columbus, or maybe even if you're Spanish, because he flew under... What was it Queen Isabella? I think right. So the um, the Spanish queen. But still, like you look around, and there are 
Christopher Columbus statues all over the place. I know there's a big one in New York City. Like there's a, is it called Columbus Circle? I think it is. Um, I just saw an article that was someone had posted on Facebook, and I guess in Sacramento, in the state capital, there is a rotunda, and there's a statue of Christopher Columbus in Sacramento in the center of this rotunda. And of course, people are saying, oh, we got to tear that down. We got to take care of that, take that statue down. I'm thinking to myself, why is Christopher Columbus in the California state capitol? What is his connection to California? That doesn't make any sense at all. And, you know, we, we should move that statue. There should be a Californian in the state capital of California. I mean, someone like, I don't know, John Muir, Leland Stanford, who helped build the Transcontinental Railroad, Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve Jobs is a hugely transformational character in human history. Um, yeah, <laughs> why not Steve Jobs? Certainly more than Christopher Columbus. Um, so it, it's just remarkable how we see him everywhere. Now, Another friend of mine, um, my friend Jack, who lives up in San Francisco, he and I were swapping some email this morning, and and I, he was filling me in on what's going on there. Now, he, he lives in North Beach, and if you've ever been in San Francisco, you know that North Beach is a is kind of like the, the old Italian community of San Francisco. I mean, a lot of those ethnic lines have been broken up. I mean, a little bit of a tangent here. Um, Back when I was born, I was born in San Francisco, and back in the day, the San Francisco was largely ethnic neighborhoods, and my family all lived in the Irish neighborhood. That's where my mother and father met, and all my cousins or everyone was from this Irish, you know, community in San Francisco, you know, Eureka Valley. It's now the Castro District. Uh, so in the 60s, you know, when there was white flight and a lot of people moved to the suburbs, a lot of those ethnic lines sort of broke down. Um, and there, and that whole neighborhood changed. I mean, if you've ever been on Castro Street, oh my God, it's completely different, I'm sure, than when it was when it was a Irish Catholic community. Um, but North, North Beach was always the Italian area. And there, Columbus Day is like a national holiday in North Beach because they're celebrating their Italian heritage. Now, never mind the fact that, you know, I don't know what the percentage of Italians are in North Beach, but it's got to be well under 50 percent. I'm certain of that. Um, but anyways, my, my friend Jack was telling me about this, that, you know, where Coit Tower is in San Francisco? You know, it's a really famous um, you know, tower there in the northeastern part of the city. There's a statue of Christopher Columbus there, which, again, makes sense because it's in the North Beach or right near North Beach. And he was telling me that the San Francisco Police Department was up there protecting the Columbus statue recently because they were afraid it was going to be knocked over by vandals. And and they were trying to, like, have some, you know, some semblance of order up there. And then he checked on it later and the cops had left. And sure enough... There were vandals there, and they had put red paint on Columbus's hands, you know, to signify the blood on his hands when he came to the Americas. And if you look at the base of the statue, there's all kinds of graffiti, and it's um, NLM, not BLM for Black Lives Matter. It's NLM. And I had to think about it, and I was like, oh, I bet that N stands for native, like native lives matter. Like, oh, okay. I get it. Um, so sure enough, yeah, there's there's a lot more. Uh, there was a, the statue was vandalized, and then suddenly, the city just removed the statue before it could literally be torn um, off its its bolts, you know, that was holding it onto the to the platform. And so now, there's no statue there, and then that's now inviting a conversation in San Francisco about who should be replaced, and naturally, people are saying, well, it should be an Italian. Because this is in the Italian neighborhood of, of San Francisco. And I get that. And people are saying, well, what Italian is, what famous Italian comes from San Francisco? And then a lot of people are saying, Joe DiMaggio. He, of course, you know, the, um, the Yankee Clipper, you know, the center fielder of the New York Yankees. Of course, yeah, he was definitely from San Francisco. Um, but you want to have a ball player there? You know, I'm, I'm the, as big of a baseball fan as they come, but I'm not sure if he's the right guy. And then Jack was telling me that they they are now coming forward with this guy. And I never knew his name, but his name, Amadeo Pietrio Giannini. Um, 
also known as A.P. Giannini. And this guy was the inventor of the modern day banking practices. He opened up banking to the middle class, especially undeserving immigrants. I mean, he is the founder and president of the Bank of Italy that later became the Bank of America. An Italian in San Francisco essentially started a bank that became the Bank of America. Now, can you think of any better person? Say what you will about banking, but this is a person that is a success story and an Italian and a San Franciscan. And wait till you read, like, like I'm going to read a little bit of a short story about this guy. And you're going to say, oh, this is an automatic. This is another no brainer. So as the founder and president of the Bank of Italy, which later to be renamed Bank of America, which would go on to become the biggest bank in the nation, he was a driving force to get San Francisco financed and rebuilt after the 1906 earthquake catering to all the common folk who the traditional banks wouldn't do business with, who just needed loans to rebuild their businesses and homes. And he did this from a table on a sidewalk after risking his life with the help of a garbage man and his horse-drawn garbage hauler by promising his son a job if he helped him. And they moved, this is again right after the 1906 earthquake and the fire and everything else, they took the vault from his bank, they put it on this essentially garbage hauler, and they, they covered it with garbage to kind of cloak it so they wouldn't get robbed. And they moved this the bank's records and all the contents of that vault down the peninsula to rural San Mateo, which that's like really close to the, I, I was raised in Burlingame, which is just right next to San Mateo. So he took the, um, the garbage hauler down to San Mateo. And then um, he was able to later on finance much of the rebuilding of San Francisco after the earthquake. And that garbage man's son, who he promised a job to, he worked for Bank of America for the rest of his life. So you're thinking, this is great. This is, this is an example, I think, of a reassessing our values, asking ourselves, who do we want to celebrate and why, and challenging some of our previous assumptions. Because just for generations upon generations, we're told Columbus discovered America, he's important. But really, do we need to be celebrating Christopher Columbus in a rotunda in Sacramento? The, the state capital, that doesn't make sense. It sort of makes sense in the Italian community in San Francisco, but aren't there better people to celebrate? And this guy here, AP Giannini, I think he fits the bill. So Jack, thanks for sharing that with me. I appreciate it. That was That's a great story. I mean, this is the kind of thing we should be doing is just reassessing our values. So this obviously leads to the fact, who next? And there's, for a lot of conservatives, their hair is on fire. They think history is being torn down. History is being whitewashed. Well, that's what conservatives are largely about, right, is conserving, um, not not changing. They want to hold on to what to the past. That's often a conservative ideal. Um, so a lot of conservatives are, are really upset, concerned about statues coming down. But I remember I asked this to some friends on Facebook, what about FDR? I mean, FDR, you know, celebrated as one of the best presidents in our nation's history. But he, everyone knows the story. You know, he, he had internment camps for Japanese Americans. I mean, these were prisons in remote parts of the nation. I mean, they had them in the deserts of um, the deserts in uh, Nevada. They had internment camps in the Eastern Sierras far removed from civilization. Um, and, and, and they also in turn, not just the Japanese, but the Germans. And, and again, the Italians, we we're just talking about the Italians. So they were interned as well. They were essentially put in prison camps. I mean, a great person to hear about this is George Takai, who played Commander Sulu on Star Trek. And when he was a child, he was in one of those internment camps. So you think to yourself, well, that is just outrageous. I mean, that is a total violation of the principles of what America is supposed to be about in terms of equality under the law. These people were citizens of the United States. They were rounded up and thrown in prison without a trial. They were assumed guilty. 
and and they weren't let out until f- much later into into the progression of the war. Maybe I'm not sure exactly. Was it before the war ended or after the war? I don't know. That's a that's a stain in our history. Yet it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt who progressives are huge fans of because they're big fans of the New Deal. And so, again, this makes us ask ourselves tough questions. Do we want to celebrate a guy who imprisoned innocent Americans and violated their habeas corpus rights that are guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, violated their rights to a speedy trial, and instead just throw them in a prison camp? So... You know, this cuts both ways. It's not just taking down Confederates or conservatives. I mean, there's certain liberals that need to come down too. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be even-handed about this, now, of course, I, I brought this up to some people, and they're like, "Whoa, wait a minute, hold on. Let's just take care of the Confederates first. But I think my guess is is that they don't want to go after FDR because. They like him and he's going to be protected and FDR, he'll be excused and they'll just say, oh, that was that was an unfortunate part of his history, but doesn't really represent the man. So you're going to start to see excuses in many ways, like certain people will excuse Robert E. Lee and say that he was a great general, a man of stature, a, um, a wise man, a great leader and look the other way for the cause that he represented. So very interesting. So this whole issue of statues coming down, I think is is very interesting. And again, this is a major inflection point in our nation's history. As we're going through this, we're asking ourselves hard questions. We're asking ourselves, who do we want to celebrate? Who's worthy of celebration? Who is consistent with our own values? Who's consistent with our inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? And I think those are very fair questions to ask. Okay, so last bit here. Um, This part will be short. I'm going to talk a little bit about DACA. And, you know, DACA is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, It's the United States immigration policy that allows some individuals with unlawful presence in the United States after being brought to the country as children to receive renewable two-year period. I can go through this whole thing, but basically what this is is their children. They came to America with their parents. They entered the nation illegally, undocumented, but these were children that you know, they were just with their parents. They were two years old, five years old, um, and they've lived their whole life in America. And DACA is basically a plan to essentially legalize them, um, to make them legal residents. It's not the DREAM Act, by the way. That's not the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act actually has a pathway to citizenship. DACA doesn't. And DACA was something that was put forward by President Obama. Um, but then President Trump repealed it. And now recently the, the Supreme Court has said, that President Trump can't repeal DACA, and now DACA is now back to being legal. And so, therefore, these these essentially illegal immigrants, but to no fault of their own because they came to America when their parents, when they were children, they are now going to be given the right to be legal citizens. They're not going to have to be deported, which is ultimately what Trump was trying to do. I mean— there's like about 700,000 of them. I mean, imagine if the government was rounding up 700,000 people and deporting them. I mean, that's just outrageous, in my opinion, because they have rights, too. The other guy has rights, too. Um, but it makes me think about this notion of the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, the Pledge of Allegiance is another one of these topics that people get really fired up about. And I should do a podcast just about the Pledge of Allegiance, because in my opinion, it's pledging allegiance is the opposite of liberty. (laughs) Pledging allegiance is basically being subservient to a person or thing, and pledging allegiance to a flag is kind of odd. Um, I understand what the flag symbolizes. I get that. But Say what you will about this, but let's just take the final line of the Pledge of Allegiance with liberty and justice for all. Okay, it it doesn't mean all Americans or all white Americans or all men. It means all, 
everybody, <laughs> um, including these DACA immigrants. So if we're concerned with liberty, we should we should libertize them and, and let them be free to choose where they want to live and do so legally. If we're all about justice, these are people that committed no crime. They shouldn't have to be uprooted from their from America and then deported by force to Mexico or or Puerto Rico or not Puerto Rico, like um, uh, you know the Dominican Republic or Cuba or or Honduras. I mean, they don't need to do that. I mean, that's not justice ripping someone else at someone out of their nation. Um, at well, the place where they live and then forcibly ejecting them to another country of which they have no history, no connection. That's not justice. I mean, if we're all about liberty and justice for all, this, this should be an easy one is to allow these DACA immigrants to become legal residents. You don't necessarily be citizens. That's a whole other level. Um, you know, whether or not they're eligible to be citizens, and we can discuss that. I, I would say there is, there should be a pathway to citizenship. Um, but at the very least, they shouldn't be living in the shadows. They shouldn't be living in a manner that they're afraid that an ICE member, an INS member is going to find them and seize them and put them in chains and then send them thousands of miles away. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me at all. But, you know, of course, President Trump you know, he when he made his announcement speech to run for president, he talked about these immigrants from Mexico are rapists. And, and he went on and on. I mean, it's like he amplified this whole war on immigrants um, is essentially what we have. And and people will say, well, we mean legal immigration, not illegal. Well, still, come on. If, if you are about our inalienable rights of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, People should have the liberty to live where they want and just make if you want to make it legal. OK, fine. Then make make legal immigration easier, easier, faster, less expensive. You can make citizenship difficult. OK, I get that. But legal legal residency is just so easy. Why do we need to make that hard? Um, so and then if we made legal um, immigration easier, faster, cheaper, then there would be less illegals. <laughs> it, would, it would for those that are all about law and order, it would solve their problem. Um, but it does make you wonder, like when Trump is saying these things, is he really that bigoted? And some people will say, oh, obviously, yes, he is. But then you also wonder, well, maybe is he just pushing buttons, firing up his base, the base that largely opposes the illegal immigration? In some cases, maybe are, ba are bigoted. It's interesting. I mean, it's all very calculated. Um, and by the way, remember, you know, he's, he's in Tulsa. He's going to give a rally tomorrow night in Tulsa. He was supposed to give it today on Juneteenth. I don't think he even realized it was Juneteenth or understood what the holiday meant. Um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. So... I, know, I, I think this whole idea, the, I did a podcast about this. The other guy has rights too. Illegal immigrants have rights. They have inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That, that, those are inalienable rights. Those are natural rights. They don't stop at a border or a border wall. Those rights still exist for everybody. Um, DACA immigrants have those rights. So do blacks when they were freed from slavery. They always had those rights, except those rights were stolen from them. They were violated by the government. The government is supposed to exist to secure our rights, not to violate them. Protecting DACA immigrants is a way of securing those rights. Repealing DACA is not. Now, just at another tangent, it is interesting that President Obama implemented DACA on an executive order which generally speaking, I don't like executive orders because it allows the president to act like a king. It basically combines the legislative and executive branches in one. But it is interesting that President Obama got DACA approved as an executive order, but then President Trump tried to reverse it as an executive order. But President Trump was denied by Supreme Court, yet President Obama was passed through. So there's an inconsistency there. I don't know how that's going to be resolved, but it is interesting. Um, so 
yeah, what are the themes? I mean, today, I mean, this is all about justice. That's what this podcast episode is about. Um, think about Juneteenth. I mean, what are the, the virtues of Juneteenth? That's about independence and justice. Talking about these statues, what are the, what are the virtues there? That's about integrity, integrity to what our values are, practicing, um, living our values, essentially, integrity and justice with the statues. And then DACA, what's that about? That's about independence. That's about integrity and about justice. So we're going through this transformational time in American history, and it's all about justice. We're making progress. We have a long way to go. But I think we're growing up more. We're getting better. And I think this is good. And it's disruptive. But you don't really get positive change unless there's disruption, because you have to shed the ways of the past. You kind of have to break through to the, uh, like, the, I'm going to quote the doors, break on through to the other side. Sometimes it gets a little messy when you do that. Um, but ultimately, it's a good thing. It's a natural evolution. So um, if you if you want to discuss this more, look me up on Facebook, uh, the John Riley Project. Um, I've also got the uh, John Riley Project Insiders Group. It's a closed group, and you just got to answer a few questions to get in. I let everybody in. Um, if you want to have more conversation about this, some of my podcast listeners like to challenge me on the issues, and that's a great place to do it, is on social media. So you can look me up there. I'm also on Twitter. Um, um, John Riley Poway is my handle there. So you can check me out there. And if you'd like to get on my mailing list, that'd be great. You can go to my website, johnreillyproject.com and just go johnreillyproject.com slash subscribe and you can get on our mailing list. So really in, invite more conversation and look forward to more discussion. That's I love my, I love having um, guests on these podcasts as well, where we can talk through the issues. So that's a big part of my motivation for doing this podcast is I love the discussion because I learn, hopefully you learn, and I think we're all better for it. And we can do it in a rational, civil way and still be respectful um, to even with people that we disagree. Um, I, I do want to have a closing quote. This one's from Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> this is amazing. I'm, I'm quoting like all of these progressive champions, Cornell West, Dr. Martin Luther King, um, who else? Uh, well, here, um, Teddy Roosevelt, although he's a Republican, but I think most people would agree he's a progressive. It's interesting because I don't consider myself a progressive. I'm definitely much more of a liberty guy. But in a lot of cases, there's alignment, you know, on these issues, as a person that supports liberty, man, I am on board with Juneteenth. I am on board with making changes to the statues that we choose to celebrate. And I'm on board with giving DACA immigrants a have, being legal, a legal residency in the United States of America. So I'm quoting a lot of progressive champions, but I'm doing it because this is aligned with my values. In some other categories, I'm very much on the opposite side of some of my progressive friends. But where I have alignment, hey, let's let's come together and let's celebrate the overlap in the Venn diagram where we come together. So anyways, this is the closing quote. It's from Teddy Roosevelt. Justice, again, that's the theme today, justice. Justice consists not in being neutral between right and wrong, but in finding out the right and upholding it wherever found against the wrong. So that's a great line from Teddy Roosevelt. And I'm going to leave it there. So this is episode number 141 of the John Riley Project. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And we'll be back again real soon. We'll see you later, friends. Bye-bye.